A global outcry has followed the beheading in Saudi Arabia of a young Sri Lankan housemaid accused of killing a child in her care. Saudi authorities are accused of restricting proper legal assistance to the victim. The plight of migrant workers in Saudi Arabia is causing concerns and questions are being raised about what's being done to address it. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazm Seeker. The beheading in Saudi Arabia of a young Sri Lankan maid continues to stir anger in her home country and beyond. The case is also drawing widespread criticism despite repeated appeals to the Saudi government from Sri Lanka as well as rights groups. Sri Lanka has recalled its ambassador to Saudi Arabia after the execution of Rizana Nafik over the death of an infant in her care in 2005. She was beheaded in the town of Dawadmi near the capital Riyadh on Wednesday morning after being sentenced to death in 2007. She was accused by her Saudi employer of killing his infant daughter while she was bottle feeding her. The case once again highlights the plight of thousands of migrant workers in Saudi Arabia. Human rights groups say access to adequate translation and legal assistance is limited or non-existent. Rights groups raised concerns about the fairness of the trial as Nafik was denied access to legal representation and adequate translation. More now from Minel Fernandez in the Sri Lankan capital, Colombo. <laughs> A mother's anguish. Rizana's mother broke down when talking on the phone to this social worker who had supported the family throughout the case. The girl was 17 years old and had never been out of her village. In this, her first letter home, she writes how difficult she was finding the job. It was work, work, work all the time for her and uh, lack of training in running a home. Because she's 17 years old, she has not had the experience of bottle feeding children. And she went as a housemaid but was given the task of feeding this baby. Sri Lankan papers gave full coverage to the case. Numerous attempts to secure pardon during the seven years since she was sentenced to death failed. Even this last-minute appeal from her family, filmed three days ago, came too late. And it's this shack that Rizana's family calls home, a home she had hopes of rebuilding. It's poverty that pushed her into the situation. I'm sad for her as a fellow citizen that she had to face this end. Broken dreams, disappointment and even death. Common factors for thousands of Sri Lankans like Rizana searching for a better life. For those left behind, nothing but heartache. Mina Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. Well, the Sri Lankan government has condemned the girl's beheading. The foreign ministry in Colombo issued this statement. President Mahinda Rajapaksa made a personal appeal on two occasions immediately after the confirmation of the death sentence and a few days ago to stop the execution and grant pardon to Ms. Razana. President Rajapaksa and the government of Sri Lanka deplore the execution of Ms. Razana Nafik despite all efforts at the highest level of the government. Well, let's talk more about this now with our guests. From New York, we have Nisha Varia, senior researcher in the Women's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. Varia has worked on domestic workers' rights and published numerous reports on migrant workers across Asia and the Middle East. From Beirut, Caroline Nanza, project manager at Caritas Migrant Center in Lebanon. And joining us on the phone from Colombo, Rajiva Ragasinga, member of the Sri Lankan parliament and presidential advisor. He was also the former head of the Sri Lankan Peace Secretariat and the Secretariat to the Ministry of Human Rights. Good to have you all with us. Uh, Nisha Vari, I want to start with you. Um, to what extent does this particular case then fit into uh, a wider pattern of, of uh, domestic workers and, and foreign workers in Saudi Arabia? This tragic case is um, 
definitely just one of many problems and abuses that may fall upon domestic workers in Saudi Arabia. There are hundreds of thousands of Sri Lankan workers um, working as domestic workers in Saudi Arabia and in other countries in the Gulf. Um, many of them, like Risana, face problems during recruitment. Her documents were falsified to show that she was 23 when she was only 17. And we know that there are many other cases of deception or migrants being charged very high fees that leave them greatly in debt at the recruitment stage, which leaves them vulnerable to abuse once they migrate abroad. Once they are working in Saudi Arabia, they're not covered under the labor law, so they're not entitled to the same protections that other workers can take for granted, such as a day off once a week or limits to their working hours. Our research has found that many of these domestic workers may be working 18 hours a day, seven days a week for months or years on end. Many of them are confined to the workplace, um, may not be getting enough food. and. All of these conditions contribute to factors that can give rise to other forms of abuse, such as physical abuse and sexual abuse. All right. Um, if a domestic... Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, continue what you're saying. Um, if a domestic worker comes into conflict with the law, such as Rizana Nafik, um, she may not have access to a lawyer, she may not have access to a translator, she often doesn't know what her rights are. So either when domestic workers are victims or when they're being accused of a crime, it's very difficult for them to get uh, fair treatment or, or due process in the Saudi judicial system. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, 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 what can be done about this and, and, and who, is, who is to blame uh, for all of this. Uh, but uh, let's get the view from Colombo then. Rajiva Ragasinga joining us uh, on the phone. Um, first of all, what is your uh, take on this particular case? Obviously, it's caused quite an outcry uh, back in, in, in your country. Are you satisfied uh, with the way your government um, has reacted to this? Could they have done more? Have they done enough? Well, I think they did their best in a situation in which, unfortunately, it's uh, very much on the side of the hiring country. And I think it's very important that, for instance, the various conventions on domestic work uh, that the ILO, uh, I think, finalized a couple of years back, 2011, I think we need to move towards universal acceptance of these. Um, I think it's also especially important to move towards much greater protection to begin with, you know, better training. We have in the last two or three years tried to develop this through much better training mechanisms, familiarization mechanisms, education about rights, plus better monitoring of uh, people who go out. Uh, but I think you have had a situation where people, in a sense, slip through the net. I mean, in this particular case, we had the uh, regular rules, uh, but it looks like the, both the girl and the agent, uh, you know, falsified matters so that her age uh, was given as much more than it was. And on the one hand, of course, we really need to have better structures. We're moving towards it, but you need international support for this as well. Um, and second, you have to also bear in mind that uh, because of what seems to be the economic attractions, even though everything the lady from Lebanon said was true about the possible risk and so on, uh, people still choose to go out. And of course, the majority of stories that come back uh, do not discourage them. Because although we need the conventions, because even one abuse is one abuse too many, uh, there is also a situation where people do want to keep going for these jobs because they, mm -hmm. the grass seems green at them. Well, you say, you say that uh, the case of uh, what happened with uh, Rizana Nafiku, she, that she was somebody who, who slipped through the net. But from what I've read on this, um, uh, there are dozens and dozens of cases just like this. And it, it's a little bit more than somebody just slipping through the net, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by dozens and dozens of cases. I don't think there are many cases of very young girls having birth certificates falsified. Is that what you meant? You think there are dozens and dozens of such? such well, what I mean is that, that there are so many cases of this of this happening where employment papers uh, have been falsified and and and, and so on. And the, the impression I get from what you you've been saying is that this is really the exception rather than the rule. 
No, I think it is the exception rather than rule if you look at the numbers that go. But the very fact that it happens indicates that obviously I don't suppose it is the only case. I think, you know, both you and I are talking in a vacuum. If you give, uh, give me the instance that you'd know, I think you'd find that we're not talking about massive numbers. But that is precisely why, as I said, in the last three years, we have been trying to develop much better protection mechanisms, indeed even um, uh, uh, certificates, as it were, from the Grama Milgari, that's the local um, official, the village admin, as it were, so that you have as much information as possible before people go away. You know, I've been trying to actually set up things like vulnerability indices, whereby the Women and Children's Committees of the divisions would know exactly who is going and whether they've had the proper training. But you have to remember that Rizana, I think, went away something like seven years ago. All right, let's let's turn to uh, Caroline uh, Nansa then in Beirut. Uh, uh, where does this particular case rank, in your opinion, uh, when you look at uh, how this compares to some of the work uh, that you've done where you are? <clears throat> so the Caritas Lebanon migrant sector uh, works specifically in Lebanon. However, it is true that um, I even for Lebanon, you don't you rare, you don't have uh, or you haven't had for a very long time. Uh, women, uh, mig migrant workers um, sentenced to, to death, uh, you still have a, a lot of uh, migrant workers who actually in the region suffer abuse and uh, are, are sentenced for life. Um, and um, so this is not um, a, a, a specific case. Obvious, obvious. If uh, also, if obviously this is one of uh, the worst case scenario that could happen. Uh, to Nafik, um, uh, that we obviously uh, very much regret. Um, however, we would like also to stress that this is also um, linked to the actually the the sponsorship which is in place in the whole region, which is the kafala system. And this kafala system has uh, I mean, has been shown by many many um, researches that this kafala systems actually ties the employer to the employee. employee. And this uh, kafala system is also the cause of the many abuses that the the maid workers suffer here in the Middle East. Nishavara, you were nodding in agreement uh, earlier there to, to some of what you just heard. Uh, it, it, it appears that there's plenty of blame to go around. Where do you think it should start? When yes, do well, I think it should? There Sorry. There are many reforms that would have to take place to protect domestic workers. Um, you know, in response to whether Risana's cake was. Um, isolated or whether the Sri Lankan government should do more. Uh, you know, I do think both the Sri Lankan government and the Saudi government could be doing a lot more. Maybe she's only uh, one person who was recruited as, at age 17 and then executed for a crime she did when she was that young. But there are thousands of Sri Lankan domestic workers who are complaining of non-payment of wages for months or years at a time, who have been suffering physical and sexual abuse. There have been very high-profile cases, for example, of Sri Lankan domestic workers who had nails hammered into them by their employers, real forms of, of torture. and. Um, the, the Sri Lankan government has really failed in its responsibility to provide a support to its workers abroad. Its embassies um, have not had enough qualified uh, personnel to, to respond to these complaints and to provide them shelter and legal aid. And as Caroline mentioned, there is a great responsibility with the governments that are employing these workers, um, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Kuwait, many of the countries in the Middle East uh, do not include domestic workers under their labor laws, and they do use this immigration sponsorship system, which gives employers incredible power over domestic workers. It means that uh, a worker cannot leave her job without permission from her employer. If she uh, leaves the home because she's suffering abuse, she may be treated as an immigration offender instead of somebody who needs help. All right, let's get, uh, let's get Mr. Uh, Weir Sanha's uh, uh, view on that. Uh, shouldn't your go governments like yours in, in Sri Lanka be uh, doing more to, to, to educate uh, workers about what they're getting into here, uh, the rights and, and, and basically uh, more knowledge about, about what, what, is, what could potentially happen to them? The name is Weir Sanha, by the way. 
Um, you know, I know I do not don't expect perfection, but it would be nice if there was a slightly greater effort. Um, no, I mean, you're perfectly right. We have to do much more to educate, and this has been an ongoing process over the last two or three years. We've actually developed a ministry that has much better systems, but I think you have, you know, you can't ever be satisfied. You have to keep doing better and better in terms of educating these people, bearing in mind that very often they come uh, from uh, fairly poor backgrounds, and especially when you get young girls coming in, uh, you can't do enough. Uh, I think uh, the point the lady made before about the need for better systems in country is also the case. We've been trying to have a system developed of registering and recording. Uh, Unfortunately, as you're probably aware, you need quite a lot of personnel to do this, and we perhaps need to expand our numbers, which is not easy. I mean, as I kept saying earlier, you also have to remember that once they're in that country, having signed a contract, um, which may be a very unfair contract, uh, they're at the mercy, really, of the conditions within that country. And as you know, Saudi Arabia is one of the few countries in the world that you know, allows the execution of minors, which may seem horrible to, to us, mm-hmm. but that is their law. And that is why I think it's particularly important that this convention be signed because, in a sense, for a country like Sri Lanka, which is exporting workers who want to go and work in such countries, however uh, terrible some of the stories they hear, don't forget they also hear very good stories. Um, I think it's very important to have international rules in place or conventions, and in particular, uh, provision. All right, but but international rules and conventions, conventions are one thing, but actually things. enforcing those rules. Is, is, is something else, uh, Mr. Wajasinha. One, one of the things I want to put to you is the fact that um, there are uh, many domestic workers from uh, Sri Lanka who are, are sent to, to countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, countries in the Gulf, uh, many of them as well from, from the Philippines, uh, from elsewhere in, in, in South Asia. So there is an economic uh, uh, dependence there, certainly, and the suggestion has been made that there is also an unwillingness uh, for many of the governments of these Asian countries that provide so many uh, low-wage workers to uh, bite the hand that feeds them, uh, if I can put it that way. What do you, what, what do you say to that? I don't think it's a question of biting the hands of people. You have to remember that when you said people are sent, it's not people are sent. People choose to go. There are actually queues of people applying for these sorts of jobs. And, you know, it's very easy for you or me who've never had the need to go to, you know, do this, to understand the imperatives. But you don't use words like they're sent. They well, you say people choose to go, but it, it, very often it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dire economic cho- choice that is almost forced on them. And we started on that, and I said it's not perfect, with guidance in every respect. The second is develop, as uh, the lady so said from the beginning before, better protection mechanisms and information mechanisms so that the workers can feel... Uh, indeed, we must have an obligation well, as a reporting mechanism, and the agents and the sub-agents, who are very often the people who uh, shift the rules a bit, have to be held more accountable. But the third area is that of the rules of the country concerned, and that is where I think you need international conventions. Now, I would be the first to say that the Philippines, which exports more workers, has uh, much better systems of protection. Again, the Philippines will tell you it's not ideal. People do uh, suffer. But I think we need to start at least moving towards the levels they have had. And in the last two years, we really have been moving for that, you know, in terms of having. All right. Well, we've been asking viewers to uh, join this conversation as well. So let's pause for a moment just to share with you some of what's been posted on the Al Jazeera Facebook page uh, regarding this topic. Matt says there should be a travel ban to Saudi Arabia. These maids are just modern day slaves with no rights and are regularly scapegoated. Sarah argues Saudi Arabia is a country that practices Sharia law, and if you commit a crime, whether you're white, brown, native, non-native, you will receive a trial and then a punishment. Beatrice says housemaids have no rights in Saudi. Another Sri Lankan took poison after mistreatment and was hospitalized in demand when she was denied travel back to her country. Mohammed Yusuf asks, is it the death sentence or the beheading itself which was the problem? Uh, 
obviously people were, were, were quite shocked by the fact that uh, Saudi Arabia in, in the 21st century is a country that still uh, chooses to uh, behead uh, people uh, as a form of execution. But there are a number of other uh, countries in the world, of course, that, that still uh, enforce uh, the death penalty. But I, I, I want to turn back to this issue of, of, of the, the general um, uh, mistreatment of, of, of domestic workers and, and foreign workers in countries like Saudi Arabia and, and throughout other countries in the Middle East. And Caroline Nanser, if I could turn back to you uh, on this. Um, what effect do you think does the, the, the sort of the naming and shaming of offenders do? I mean, this is this particular story, and I know you mentioned this earlier, is 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 perhaps a, an extreme case, uh, and it's one that garnered a lot of attention in the news media in the last couple of days. But does it really have any effect in the long run? Yeah, I mean, such case actually. Um um, enables to shed the light of how many uh, millions of migrant workers actually uh, live, um, in which condition they live in the Middle East. Because as I said, I mean, this is also, I mean, what happened to Nafik is also the consequence of a, of a, of a system that should uh, be ended as soon as possible. And um, I mean, this is also, I mean, an opportunity actually to raise awareness uh, among everyone in the society, including the authorities of the host country, but also the authorities of the country of origin as well. I mean, it enables civil society to, uh, to uh, shed lights on, on, on such conditions, but also on the numerous abuses uh, that women migrant workers live on a, on a daily basis. For instance, the migrant work, the Caritas Lebanon migrant workers receive on a daily basis um, dozens of, of, of uh, women who actually cho uh, chose to come to Lebanon, however, who were not uh, always aware of the conditions, who have sometimes also been uh, lied to uh, by the employment agency when they left the country. There are also, as you, men as you mentioned, like many economic factors All right. or like that are all right, oh, just, just, in the, just in the minute or so that we've got left, I uh, just want to give the last word to Anisha Varia on this. W what effect do you think this particular case will have on, on, on bringing awareness uh, of this problem? Because this case, as tragic as it is, um, unfortunately there have been others uh, that have come before it. So what effect do you think it will have in the long run? Well, it depends on the response. If the Sri Lankan government says this is the responsibility of the Saudi government, and if the Saudi government says this is the responsibility of the Sri Lankan government, nothing will change. Every government really has to take responsibility for what it can do to better protect these workers who are at high risk of abuse. There is a new convention uh, adopted in 2011 on domestic workers. Neither Sri Lanka nor Saudi Arabia has adopted it. They should take action to do that. And so what I hope is that people can, you know, while mourning the case of Rizana Nafik and, and her tragic fate, really look at the broader situation of domestic workers and the many reforms that have to take place in recruitment, in training, in labor laws, in immigration sponsorship laws, right. to really make sure that tragedies like this don't happen again. All right, that's going to have to be the last word. Thank you to uh, all of our guests from New York, Nisha Varia from Beirut, Caroline Nanta, and joining us on the phone from Colombo, Rajiva Wijasanha. Uh, before we go, we want to share some more of the many responses that we got on Thursday's Inside Story on female infanticide in India and the worrying fall in the number of women in the population there. It's got a lot of you talking. Marie Lynn says the millions of girls missing in India because of this practice are so very much a part of this story. Not only is it wrong, but it has practical consequences in the long run like the mismatched gender statistics and all the problems that go along when areas have way more men than women in the population. Mei Ling says, I don't see how it is quite possible for the policy maker or educators to change people's mindset within a short period of time. The law banned the dowry system quite a while ago. It still exists because those parents are under pressure of the traditions and the law is still relatively new to their generation. And Kimberly says education is the tool that can help break the pattern of gender discrimination and bring change for women in developing countries. 
And that's it for this edition of Inside Story. Remember, if you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Hazem Seeker. Join me 24 hours from now for our weekly look at events inside Syria. Until then, thanks for watching. The latest news is up next. Bye for now.